recording. Perfect. So as you can see from this list, I have most of my background is in exercise and sports science. So I have a bachelor's in sports science and a master's in exercise physiology. And actually my uh, master's degree, um, I was working with primarily female elite athletes and women who were survivors of breast cancer. So I kind of my journey to this research space was a little bit non-linear, if you will. But after my master's degree in exercise physiology, I took a job at the VA Healthcare Center in Durham, North Carolina. And while I was working at that job, my main, my main goals were to coordinate a controlled trial, a randomized controlled trial of an exercise program for older veterans with PTSD. So that's really what got me started on the journey, the exercise and trauma more broadly. And I'll just revisit that briefly. But after I had that experience, I went on to get my PhD in kinesiology and community health. Um, and in that context, I worked a lot in sexual violence and exercise. So just to bring you back to my beginning, again, I kind of got my start in this, in this research as an exercise physiologist and research coordinator for a physical activity trial for older veterans with PTSD. And if you're interested in this area at all, Dr. Catherine Hall was the PI for that trial. There is a lot of outcome related papers that are available and online for that trial. A lot of really good outcomes came out of it. The exercise program improved physical and mental health pretty broadly, social cohesion. It was a really, really nice program to be able to be my introduction to this area. And it was something that I learned a lot while I was coordinating. So I was doing things like recruiting people, calling participants to try to get them to enroll. But as the exercise physiologist, I was also the main person who was in the gym with all the veterans and really coordinating all of their exercise programs. So I was writing their program for them. I was checking in with them throughout the week. I was seeing how their exercise were going throughout the week, making sure they were doing okay. And really stood with me, the impact that this program had on people from when they started to when they finished the program. Again, they have really good outcomes that are published in these papers, but to me, like seeing the difference in outlook from start to beginning in a lot of these veterans really impacted me and stuck with me, and it's really the motivation for why I continue to be interested in this work. So a lot of that is really hard to capture. We have some qualitative studies which do a nicer job than some of these just PTSD outcomes or mental health more broadly um, improvements just by symptoms. But I just tried to include one quote here that demonstrates that a little bit more colorfully. So this quote, I've been going downhill the last couple of years with this program. My depression is better. I wake up with a goal. I'm able to do projects I haven't done in years. So yeah, that, that's really stayed with me as I've gone down my research path and it's really my motivation to continue this in this area. So one thing that I quickly learned when I started working in this area was that most of the research that we have on exercise and PTSD specifically is a primarily male demographic population. So this is primarily male veterans, police officers, and some ambulance drivers as well. And I mentioned this for a couple of reasons, one of which being, I know that pink concussions was founded on the idea of most of the TBI research being done among men. So I, I really think that's being mirrored here in the physical activity research, which is really interesting. But also, you know, a lot of the evidence that we're taking from right now, the research base being done on men, we're trying to generalize to women and we're trying to generalize to people who've experienced other types of traumas that are different from these communities. And we shouldn't really be doing that. And we shouldn't be making conclusions based off of the small area. So that was one of my main motivations to continue to go back to school for my PhD. And it's something that I've kind of tried to systematically work towards in addressing my program of research. So one of the things when I started my PhD that I became acutely really aware of, both in the literature and through my PhD studies, was just the complex presentations that people have when they experience interpersonal violence broadly. A lot of these are pretty well documented. So these are things that we would all know, mental health outcomes like PTSD, anxiety, depression, emotion dysregulation, poor body image, and disordered eating. Also pretty well documented is the psychosocial outcomes, including social isolation, shame, stigma, self-harm, self and suicidal ideation. 
more evidence is being collected on physical health, but it's kind of been understudied in this area. But we are beginning to see really strong evidence that's showing that interpersonal violence and mental health conditions more broadly are associated with poor cardio physical health and high risk for cardiovascular disease, metabolic risk, inflammatory disease, chronic pain, and functional impairment. There's also other factors within interpersonal violence more broadly that may contribute to increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So one of the projects I wanted to be able to share with you all was something that I thought you'd be interested in considering the impact of head injury that we did in this analysis. So the aim of this study that I'll talk about is to examine the impact of injury type and severity on cardiometabolic risk and functional disability among survivors of partner violence, women survivors of partner violence. So the way that I did that was I looked at two different groupings for injury type. We focused specifically on head injury versus strangulation injuries. And then within each injury type, I looked at a couple of different groups for severity of injury. So for head injury, we focused on no head injury, subconcussive head injury, and clinical TBI as the severity. And with strangulation, we looked at history without strangulation, so no strangulation, strangulation without loss of consciousness, and strangulation with loss of consciousness. And I'll talk you through the analyses that we did here, but first, I'll tell you about the sample. So the sample was a total of 51 people on average about 32 years, mostly some college education, primarily white with a range of IPV exposures, including physical, sexual, and psychological violence. And about 40, 40, about 80% had a current PTSD diagnosis. So I'll talk to you through these biomarkers. The first thing that we looked at was a range of anthropometric measures and biomarkers that are consistent with risk factors for cardiometabolic disease. And I'm gonna talk you through each one of them, but the first thing that we looked at was each biomarker and compared it to recommended values in the sample. So these are the ones, again, we looked at a range of biomarkers. I just included the ones that came back as different from recommended values here. This first one here is body mass index. It's basically a ratio of height to weight. And basically the guidance here is it having below 24.9 as being the recommended value for normal range, not associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So we see at baseline here on average, we are at 28.9, which is above recommended values. This second, Biomarker here is waist to hip ratio. Waist to hip ratio is basically a ratio from your waist to your hip, like it sounds. Generally, the guidance for this marker is we like to see a value of below 0.86 for regular risk for cardiometabolic disease. And here we see we have right at 0 0.86. For LM, this one here, the third one, LDL. LDL is a type of cholesterol, if you're familiar with good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol. LDL is the quote unquote bad cholesterol. So we like to see lower values of LDL in general. So the guidance is generally below 100 milligrams per deciliter. And here we have at baseline, just a little bit of an elevation at 100.9. So here we have just, these are the groupings that I use. So we have biomarkers by head injury type. Each one of these are a biomarker, and again, I haven't included all of the ones that we looked at here, just the ones that came back with a moderate to strong effect size. And this is only for head injury. We looked at differences by strangulation, and we didn't find many significant differences there, and it was hard to really tell if those were meaningful. So uh, I've just focused on head injury for today. The first biomarker that I have here is hemoglobin H1C. Again, with this biomarker, and for the majority of these biomarkers, the guidance is to have lower levels of them. Um, I have three different groups here, so three different groups, no head injury, head injury in the light pink, and TBI in the blue. So again, we're comparing here, this dark red is the no injury. So when we look at these groupings, it seems like head injury and TBI, they have elevated hemoglobin A1C when compared to no head injury. 
Blood glucose, again, this is similar to the rest of them. Typically, we like to see lower values for blood glucose. We'll see here that the pink and the blue, so head injury and TBI, are associated with higher levels of blood glucose. And that was statistically significant, which is why there's a star here. Pulse, again, pulse we like to see between 60 and 80. Generally, the guidance is lower values for pulse typically mean better cardiovascular health. We'll see here that both the pink and the blue, so head injury and TBI, were associated with increased pulse. LDL, so again, this is the bad cholesterol, no head injury, dark pink, light pink and blue, head injury and TBI, both have elevated levels of LDL. HDL, this is the quote unquote bad cholesterol. So typically we actually like to see higher values of HDL. So we're looking for values that are higher to be better here. And here we see no head injury and blue and pink have a little bit lower levels of HDL, which more pronounced in the head injury group, which is pink. Waist to hip ratio, similar to our baseline biomarkers, we have the red group being a little bit lower than waist to hip ratio, and then BMI similar. So we have lower BMI associated with no head injury and higher BMI associated with head injury and TBI. So the overall picture here is that association of or head injury or TBI, regardless of severity, seems to be associated with markers of risk factors for cardiometabolic disease. The second part for this analysis is looking at functional disability. And I looked at history of head injury and strangulation, along with these sociodemographic variables, including age, education, PTSD symptoms, and childhood trauma. And these outcomes are functional disability as a total score, as well as disability in cognition, mobility, and participation in society. So the summation of this slide is that these covariates along with head injury and strangulation associate, are associated with higher levels of functional disability and disability in cognition, mobility, and participation in society. So some of the key takeaways from this specific project Again, the summation of the project was pretty much that head injury, any head injury, regardless of severity, seems to be contributed to increased risk for cardiometabolic disease and functional impairments, either that total cognitive mobility or participation in society. This was really interesting to me, especially when we thought about the baseline levels. So baseline levels of those biomarkers were elevated risk as well before even controlling or looking at head injury or strangulation injury. And I th that's consistent with the research more broadly, but I think it really just emphasizes again that we shouldn't be ignoring cardiometabolic disease or cardiovascular risk in our treatment plans. The same is true for functional disability. So how people's cognitive abilities, people's able to get a ability to get around their mobility and their ability to function in society. This also really emphasizes to me the importance of acknowledging the impact of injuries on people who have experienced IPV. We need to be able to screen in treatment settings and understand the impact of these injuries on health and functional status. And the last thing here I would say is we need to be able to think about how we can integrate physical and mental health in our treatment modalities and how we can expand from our current treatments and integrate different aspects of health. So one of the things that I've been focused on for my career and one of the things that I was doing in my dissertation was thinking about physical activity specifically. So this is just a little figure. What I have here is usually when we think about our treatment schemes for people who experience violence and trauma is somebody who experiences a violence or trauma event. Oftentimes what happens is they go down this kind of negative health spiral. So we have negative impacts on physical health, negative impacts on mental health. And oftentimes people develop these kind of maladaptive coping mechanisms that can kind of perpetuate and they go down a kind of spiral until they decide to seek treatment or until something really bad happens and that prompts them to seek treatment. So right now in our treatments, what we have that we usually use are primarily mental health focused. So Excuse me. This sure. is Eve. Awesome work so far. But somebody was wondering the difference between a TBI and head injury so that we understand exactly what you're talking about. Thank you so much. So for that project, 
we looked at subconcussive head injury. So these are like a head injury that does not involve a concussion and then traumatic brain injury as being over the concussive diagnostic criteria. With TBI is generally more significant of a head injury. It would have been code. Sometimes we hit our gotcha. head and it doesn't meet that status of losing consciousness or having altered consciousness or post-traumatic amnesia. And so in this study, we, we used a validated instrument that Kim Warner put the link to the instrument in the comments. And I was actually just responding to the question as we were speaking, but the clinical interview that's very detailed and really tries to differentiate and kind of disentangle head injuries from those that meet the criteria of concussion or traumatic brain injury. Here are most of the women IPV survivors in our sample, and Kim, correct me, I shouldn't use numbers because I might get this wrong, but it was like, you know, 85 or 90% were mild in nature. That's it's correct. Only, only, that. only, <laughs> one, only one had a moderate TBI, and they also could have experienced multiple TBIs across their lifetime. And the group that had TBIs also could have experienced head injury, so subconcussive head injury and TBI. So this is a very messy sample, repetitive head injuries, repetitive abuse. So yes, the TBI, although this is simplified for that, for these analyses, the TBI group was relatively heterogeneous in that they could have experienced multiple TBIs across their lifetime. The TBIs also could have occurred within the context of an IPV relationship or with or outside of the context of an IPV relationship. And the head injuries would have been subconcussive. So no loss of consciousness, no altered mental status, and no post-traumatic amnesia. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone. The, I'm just remembering the name of that interview, the battle IPV that Kate Fortier here helps develop. It's a really, really comprehensive interview that assesses a lot of different domains. So there's definitely papers out there on that as well, if that's helpful. So I was talking about integrating physical and mental health into treatment modalities and talking about just the spiral that people tend to go down after they experience violence and trauma, which can often perpetuate a lot of these negative health outcomes, both in physical and mental health. So the main thing right now that our healthcare system tends to go towards the most validated treatments that we have are typically mental health treatments. So in our toolbox, primarily what our health system goes towards is mental health treatments. And these are things like trauma-focused therapy, cognitive behavioral therapies, and group therapies. And these are things that are all really good. They're not without their limitations. So a lot of these are really hard, especially trauma-focused therapy. Some people are really resistant to signing on to those therapies. Oftentimes people drop out. And there's still some issues like residual symptoms that are left after these treatments. And so while these treatments are often really helpful for people, there are definitely things that could be improved upon or things that could be worked on alongside of these mental health treatments. And so one of the things that I propose and one of the things that I've been working on again throughout my career is integrating physical activity as a part of treatment. As I mentioned from the beginning, when I started was a coordinator at the Durham VA, we know that physical activity can improve physical and mental health really broadly, as well as trauma-focused mental health symptoms, functional impairment, can improve cardiometabolic risk, can improve social connections. But one of the other really nice features of physical activity in general that I found, again, from working in the VA, as well as in my work in my dissertation, was that treatment engagement often is improved for people with physical activity. So one of the really nice features is physical activity tends to be a treatment modality that has low barriers to accessing care for the most part. So people might be more open to engaging in physical activity rather than signing up for a trauma-focused treatment. But again, from my experience, by the time that we had gotten through a couple of weeks of physical activity, I found that somebody who may have come in with a lot of barriers to engaging in mental health treatments 
by the time they were finished and had a lot of positive experiences with us as an exercise team, they were much more open to engaging in other treatments at the VA, signing up for trauma-focused treatment, treatments, or seeing a primary care provider about diabetes or other physical health-related issues. So it was a really nice way to kind of have a warm handoff for people to engage with other treatment modalities. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this slide is usually mostly when I speak to physical activity people. The connection between physical activity and violence in general is, is often lost because a lot of us think that physical activity is just so great and everybody should do it. And we don't always recognize that there are so many barriers to engaging in physical activity. And this is especially true for women. And this is especially true for people who've experienced violence and trauma. So I just have a couple, these are extreme examples, but just to demonstrate that exercise spaces aren't always safe and we really need to be thoughtful about how we're creating them. I, unfortunately, again, we have Larry Nasser who was abusing his athletes at USA Gymnastics for decades. We have another unfortunate example, Eliza Fletcher, a teacher in Memphis who was killed not long ago while she was on her morning run. And then the last headline is actually a local headline from where I went to high school. And that was a teacher who had abused one of his student athletes for, for years while she was in, in, in school. So just examples of how we need to be thoughtful and how the exercise environments can often actually perpetuate harm. So we really need to be thinking about how we cannot go down that when we're integrating these treatments or when we integrate things into trauma-related treatments specifically. So for my dissertation, I wanted to kind of start the process of engaging survivors of sexual violence into physical activity programs and how we can get people's voices into the creation of the programs. So there are many interesting things that happened during my time at U of I while I was doing my dissertation, one of which was COVID-19. Um, I had plans to do some other types of integrating people's voices, but it turned out to be an online survey because of a lot of logistical issues, but it was, it was all good. I've still learned some information that I'll share here. So we did a cross-sectional online survey. For the inclusion criteria for this survey, we had people whose biological sex at birth was female, who had endorsed experiencing some form of sexual violence in their lifetime, who were aged between 18 and 65, physically located in the United States. And we measured a lot of different areas including things like sociodemographic information, physical and mental health status, PTSD symptoms, exercise behaviors, exercise perceptions, and exercise preferences. So just to give you a sense of the sample, we had a total of 355 people respond. An important note for this sample is biological sex at birth was female and also um, all people in this sample responded that their gender was also female. So these are all cisgender women um, primarily between the ages of 18 and 35, primarily white, non-Hispanic, and heterosexual. So one of the first things that we asked in this survey was a blanket question, would you be interested in engaging in a physical activity program that was made for women who had an unwanted sexual experience? So pretty basic question, it hasn't really been asked in the, or documented in the literature anywhere. We'll see that most people in the sample, so we have this light pink is responding yes, the darker pink is maybe, and the blue is no. In the total sample, most people, people responded yes or maybe, and only 6% of people about had said no. An interesting comparison that we got, so typically we tend to think of people with PTSD as being hard to engage in these types of interventions and exercise programs, but people with PTSD were actually more open to engaging in these programs than people without PTSD. So here we see that almost 60% of people with PTSD said yes, 36.1% said maybe, and 4% said no. Also in that survey we asked a range of questions related to exercise preferences, like where would you like to exercise physically? Would you like to exercise in what type of social environments? Would you like an instructor? If so, what gender would you like your instructor to be? How often would you like to exercise? What intensity would you like to exercise? And how long would you like to exercise? 
So for these types of questions, we got responses that I've just summarized here. Most women in the sample said they would like to exercise at home alone with a female instructor for about three to four times a week, moderate intensity exercise sessions lasting anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Also within this survey, we asked about exercise perceptions. So perceived benefits and barriers to exercise. This was done primarily through a validated scale that had subscales attached to it. And then I also had two open-ended questions saying, if you perceive any barriers or benefits that aren't included here, please indicate those in the open-ended part and they could type in the responses. So in the perceived benefits, Again, these are summaries, but the highest subscales that we found in the perceived benefit scale was physical performance, meaning that exercise makes me perform tasks better and makes me stronger, and psychological outlook. So exercise improves my mental health. For the perceived barriers parts, the most highly endorsed barriers of exercise were hard physical exercise, meaning that completing exercise is really hard to do. And then also exercise environments, that means the safety of the environment, but also the availability. So the financial um, burden of going to gyms, but also the physical location of that gym. Being too far or too close or was, didn't have transportation and things like that. I included a couple of the quotes just to demonstrate a couple of these perceived benefits and barriers. These are mostly really quick, but I'll read those here as well. So the first one, sometimes if I'm angry, I exercise hard on purpose and it helps get the anger out. So again, there was a lot of people who really identified with exercise to improve their mental health. Another similar quote, exercise makes me feel strong. We had a lot of people say that they felt strong and in control of their bodies when they exercised, which again, I don't think is insignificant considering the, the things that people deal with when they experience sexual violence generally. And, and then for a perceived barrier, we had a lot of people respond by saying that they knew that they needed to exercise, but they couldn't because of some chronic health condition that kept them. So in this quote, the example was chronic pain. I need to exercise, but I'm in pain all the time. We saw that again and again, people saying, I know I need to, I've had a heart attack, but I don't feel like I can. A lot of people saying those types of issues. So some of the key takeaways from just that survey and this analysis. First, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. People who've experienced sexual violence seem to be really open to engaging in physical activity interventions. And even people with PTSD were really open to this. Um, so I think that there's opportunity for, for us to come in and start to, to implement these programs in ways that are meaningful to people who've experienced sexual violence. These, if we, if we start to implement these programs, these programs really do need to be tailored to the individual. So we need to be able to have, give somebody an at-home exercise prescription if they would like an at-home exercise prescription. We need to be able to have a woman instructor if they want a woman instructor. Um, we also need to be able to address these chronic health issues that tend to be happening here. So we need to have exercise professionals who can come in and adjust exercises based off of pain levels or based off of mobility status. That's really, really important. And then also making sure that we are including trauma-informed appro trauma approaches. So these are things like like integrating survivor's voice and how we make the programs as well as using things like consensual touch if we're in person. So those are really important as well. So just some overall takeaways from both of the projects that I've talked about and the talk more broadly. Violence has far-reaching impacts on physical and mental health, so people have really complex presentations that range across mental health outcomes and physical out outcomes. There's a lot of opportunity to integrate physical activity as a way to kind of treat these physical health outcomes, but in general, I think that we shouldn't be ignoring the physical health outcomes that are associated with these violent experiences especially when we're talking about women specifically. Again, we know cardiovascular health is a really big deal and one of the leading causes of mortality in women. So it's a thing that we really need to think about how we can meaningfully do that. And as always, we should be able to incorporate the voices of survivors in whatever programs that we're implementing. 
And this is the thing, again, for physical activity, especially, I'm really passionate about making spaces safe for all people in physical activity and exercise realms. So I'm open to any reactions or input on any of this. I had just some of my hopes and dreams and then questions that I'd be interested in, but I'm really open to hearing any thoughts from anybody. I'll go through these quickly. Um, so just my hopes and dreams. I'm hoping to set up a physical activity program for people who have experienced an apartment violence here at the VA. That is one of my dreams and one of the things I'm working towards. And one of the things that I'm really interesting in interested in is assessing opportunities and barriers from both patient and provider perspectives. Again, I'm really passionate about physical activity, but I know that it's not necessarily an easy thing to ask mental health providers to just start doing on the fly. So understanding what the opportunities and barriers are is something I'm interested in as well. My questions for you would be, what opportunities do you see for integrating physical activity or integrating physical health treatments more broadly? What are some barriers you may perceive to doing so? And what are things that could be helpful or supportful, supporting of you doing that or the healthcare system more broadly? Or what do you think would be helpful for survivors that you work with? This is just my email address and this QR code, if you scan it, should take you to my research gate. A lot of the stuff that I've talked about, I have, do have papers on specifically. So if you're interested, you're free to reach out or certainly find any of those papers and read them as well. I just want to say wonderful overview of your line of research. I'm really excited personally about the directions you're taking this work and where you're headed with it. But I'll talk to you more about it offline. Thanks. Love to hear from others who have questions or comments or wanted to throw some ideas around. I put the question in the chat, Takasubo or Takasubo cardiomyopathy, aka also known as broken heart syndrome. Seeing the incidence of this increasing where there was no preliminary evidence of coronary artery disease or blockages and suddenly we have a survivor in cardiomyopathy failure. Another question I had, which I did not put in the chat, and I may have missed it because of my auditory processing disorders. When survivors are going to exercise after an IPV incident, how reluctant are they to re-enter that exercise program due to the fact that the perpetrator of the violence may know where they would typically go to exercise and then that could create a resistance to re-engaging in an exercise program. And then that exacerbates the fear of engaging in exercise and then can become overcoupled with the trauma. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Well, I guess I'll start with the the cardiovascular point that you brought up. I, yeah, I, I think that with anything with physical activity, it's really important to be partnering with medical providers and, and touching base. If someone has cardiovascular risk, uh, making sure that they're cleared by a medical professional to engage in physical activity. I agree with what you had mentioned about some of these things with sudden cardiac arrest it is really, really scary. And it's something that, again, in an ideal world, I think that physical activity programs would be embedded in a healthcare system. So there would be people to make sure that we have all aspects of health coordinated together, which I think would be a benefit overall. But, you know, I agree, these cardiovascular events that seem to be happening randomly are scary for everybody and would be a concern for exercise generally. As Thank to you. They were, I've seen these incidents come out of the blue with no history of cardiac disease. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen them too. And I've seen them like both in my personal life. This happened a couple of times where I have women who have just had these cardiac events seemingly out of nowhere. It's definitely a concern. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember the details of the second. So the partner violence part of your question 
And if I'm remembering it, and you can chime in if I'm forgetting part of it, I, I think that you touched on a really good point as far as the intersections of trauma and the type of trauma that person is experiencing with physical activity is really complex. And so I think that at the end of the day, first of all, it would never force anybody to be engaging in a program. But at the end of the day, making sure that that person feels in control, as in control of engaging the program as they would like to. And so being really upfront about hey, you're in control, if you feel like this is becoming too much or you're becoming more nervous about being here, um, you do not have to keep coming. And so it touches on a point that I think is really missing right now, especially in exercise science. We don't have a lot of training in partner violence. If you're an exercise science per person, for the most part, you don't get trainings on these types of things. Uh, even trauma-informed training and exercise is, is really, really rare. So I think that there's a lot of movement towards like, there should be a lot of movement and a, a lot of training that needs to happen for exercise people specifically about how to keep the person centered, how to integrate trauma-informed practice, um, and honestly, safety planning in general should be a thing that hopefully we can get people trained on and hopefully it would be something that we could have exercise professionals partner with providers in a way that's meaningful so they could work together and provide safety plans and other avenues that would be beneficial and not make any of the stress associated with their individual situation worse. That would be the goal. I'm trying to keep up with reading the chats. Yeah. That, that was great, Michelle, and your point around exercise workers, lack of a better word being knowledgeable about trauma and IPV and interpersonal violence, especially when violence may be ongoing or somebody could be threatened or followed, things like going to the gym or finding a safe way to exercise should be part of the safety plan or in considerations, but that's just not on a lot of people's radars. So thanks for making that point. So my question was, since you're hooked up with the VA, Michelle, are you able to incorporate using occupational therapy or physical therapy to be able to kind of facilitate having some physical activity type programs and occupational therapy. I think that PTs and OTs are really, really knowledgeable, especially when it comes to dealing with people who have complex presentations or injuries are like a really good thing. And I think that we should be expanding our trainings on trauma-informed and sexual violence, partner violence, generally at those healthcare professions, because I think that could use improvement. One of the things that, again, this is more a function of our healthcare system in general, but something that would be a thing to think about, like for me, is how most of the time people get referred to PT or OT for like injury prevention or treating a specific injury. And so oftentimes like the long-term people go to PT for a couple of sessions and then they're kind of referred away. So in an ideal world, like I would love to see like a long-term health promotion, physical activity that could integrate help from PT and OT and also integrate help from mental health practitioners as well. I, I agree. They are great resources and it would be a thing to think about so how I can integrate those into programs as well. I just, want to, I just want to say thank you for everyone showing up. Thank you, Michelle, for the presentation. Thank you, Kate, for the suggestion. I appreciate everybody. Thank them for coming and everybody's efforts to make, you know, to build momentum. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Thanks, everyone. Have a great month. So we meet again. Thank you.